this conversation about allyship was, you know, becoming like front and center. It was really, really mm -hmm. high on the agenda. And it was at that point that I felt, no, I actually have some fundamental issues with how a lot of this is framed. I'm gonna have to come out of my refusal to talk <laughs> about this topic. Hello everyone, um, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello to those of you in the audience, hello to those of you watching at home, and hello to those of you who will be watching this later on demand. Um, I am Nyla Ahmed and I'll be your chair today, and it is my absolute honour to be talking to Emma Dabbery. Uh -huh. Do you know, I kept saying Dabiri and I was like, no, it's Dabbery. And then I forgot which one I said first. And then it becomes more confusing. Exactly. Um, so many people <laughs> say Dabiri that I've even, like, people have, like, you know, who are interviewing me or talking to me have made an effort to research my name. And in the research, it has said Dabiri. So then they've said Dabiri, but no, it's Dabbery. <laughs> yeah, but it's I, cool. It's I like, downloaded the audio book and was like, put it on half speed and, was, and said it along with it. Absolutely went out the window though, didn't it? Um, so Emma Dabbery is teaching fellow in the African department at SOAS, a visual sociology PhD researcher at Goldsmiths and the author of Don't Touch My Hair, which was an Irish Times bestseller. She has presented several television and radio programmes, including BBC Radio 4's critically acclaimed documentaries, Journeys into Afrofuturism and Britain's Lost Masterpieces. And today I'm going to be talking to Emma about her new book, What White People Can Do Next. Now this book is frankly incredible. It's persuasive, it's intelligent and it pulls no punches. In just 150 pages, Emma aims to grab firmly with both hands a historic opportunity to reconfigure attitudes and reignite imaginations. This is a book that asks us to stop the denial, to stop the false equivalencies, to interrogate whiteness, to interrogate capitalism, to denounce the white saviour and to abandon guilt. And it does all of this with so much hope. I'm sure after this event, you will feel galvanised to build co coalitions and to create lasting change together. Before we get started, I should say that there will be a sign-in after this event at the sign-in tent outside. Um, you can buy the book from one of the bookshops Today, um, if you're watching at home and you would like to get the book, you can also do so online at shop.edbookfest.co.uk. This year's online programme is Pay What You Can. If you are watching at home and enjoying this event, we'd absolutely love for you to make a donation if you can. You can do so at the donate button below. For today, I'll be asking some questions and we will have time at the end for questions from both our online and live audience, so please don't be shy. I'd like to ask you all to join me in a round of applause to welcome Emma to the International Edinburgh International Book Festival. Thank you. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Thank you so much for joining us today. So I guess my first question is, why did you choose the title, What White People Can Do Next? Great question. Um, it's definitely proved a controversial title and it's a title that I even feel quite like, sometimes when people are like, oh, what have you written? I, I feel quite reticent often <laughs> to share the title of this book with them. Um, I'm gonna do a little reading that will um, shed some light on the uh, decisions behind the, uh, the title choice. <clears throat> One of the things that ally allyship fails to address is the fact that you can continue to view black people as inferior while still being committed to their protection. When I remembered that many of the 19th century anti-slavery abolitionists were themselves racists who held deep-seated beliefs about black inferiority, I felt even more uncomfortable with the whole ally movement. Where the abolitionists differed from the racist slaveholders was in their response to how racial inferiors should be treated. On the belief in inferiority itself, they were often in agreement. 
In certain ways, some of today's anti-racists are the abolitionists of the 21st century. A commitment to allyship with black people doesn't automatically mean you don't think black people are somehow inferior. It means you don't think they should be treated discriminatorily as a result. Can't even read my own words. Moreover, the idea that anti-racism is an act of grace that benefits the poor black victim obscures the psychological investment in, as well as the costs of whiteness, the losses that are imbibed from its poisoned chalice for white people, as well as for black. Capitalism, patriarchy, and white supremacy have seduced and press-ganged people into servitude. By people, I mean white people. Naming whiteness is necessary. It is the invisibility of white people who are presented just as people, the default norm from which everyone else deviates, that is part of its normative power making. Yet the more you state and claim your whiteness without doing any further work to unpack what that means, the more you become fixed to that articulation of self, the more you become wedded to whiteness. Some of the most racist societies, some of the most racist societies have been ones with pronounced white identities that coexist alongside racialized others. Unfortunately, much of the present anti-racist conversation is ahistorical and lacking in this analysis. It is also generally devoid of analysis of class or capitalism, which it seems to have largely replaced with interpretations of interpersonal privilege. As such, I have, inten I have very intentionally engaged with texts from earlier generations of intellectuals and activists, and activists whose work comes with a different set of priorities, aims that seem both clearer and more collective. The 1971 Rap on Race, which is a book I refer to in this book, is a public conversation between two of the heavyweight public intellectuals of the time, the illuminating James Baldwin and the, in this book, in Rap on Race, um, at, at least, the somewhat aggravating anthropologist Margaret Mead. Baldwin reminds us that one of the persistent truths of whiteness is that all Europeans have a deadly temptation to feel a sense of biological superiority. Whiteness is always there, ever present, determining who gets a chance and who is denied opportunity. But recently I have been starting to visualize it like a horror film ghoul. It's looming in the shadows, it's threatening, but we can really activate it, energize it, and empower it by saying its name three times in the mirror. However, once evoked, what the fuck do we do with it? If we summon it and just leave it at large, free to run rampant and unchecked, it's game over as we're all subsumed by its murderous rampage. Much like the horror film Baddie, we should only invoke it to slay it. Without that second crucial part, we remain under siege, doing its bidding, enthralled to its promises and lies. This is one of the numerous reasons I increasingly feel a sense of reluctance talking to or about a generic category of white people. This book is of course called What White People Can Do Next. While I wanted to create a, practic a concrete practical resource, the title is also a provocation. Before the book was even written, I had white people, white people, I tend to put white and black in this book in inverted commas, rather than capitalizing white and capitalizing black as seems to be the, uh, uh, the, the, the current, um, the current setting. Um, before this book was even written, I had white people tweeting me to tell me how offensive the title is. You see, there is still something taboo in addressing white people. And despite anti-racism anti becoming more mainstream than ever, there is still a reflex against naming whiteness. Nonetheless, it catches your atten in uh, attention, which is precisely the intention. We have to see, we have to set whiteness up to name it, to frame it, in order to disassemble it. While of course there are parallels <clears throat> and experiential consistencies between people racialized as white, 
the differences that exist between white people in different parts of the world are also vast. Before we even get into region, socioeconomic class, beliefs or political allegiances, I think this diversity represents an opportunity to loosen the death grip of whiteness, a concept that was invented to flatten these differences in the first place. I'll stop there. Pecking up on um, the point of you putting white and black in inverted commas, you, you really under, undermine these concepts. And in the book, you say, whiteness and blackness are indeed stories. So where do these stories come from? Yeah, they have a very direct origin story. Um, it's such a significant moment in history when race as we understand it today is invented and um, socially engineered to create racism. Race is invented to create racism. Race isn't something that just exists in nature. It's not a biological truth or reality. Um, and you can trace the, the uh, kind of first conception of the white race and subsequently the black race, although they use different terminology for uh, the black race, black race at the time, um, to colonial Barbados, uh, English colonial Barbados um, in the 1600s, where after a series of uprisings between indentured Irish laborers who were not at that point understood as white people and enslaved Africans who were not yet at that point understood as black people. Um, there's a series of uprisings where the Africans and the Irish come together and they attack the English landlords. And I think there were quite a few Scottish landlords in Barbados as well at, at that time. Um, they attack them, they see them as a common enemy. Following those uprisings, there is the introduction of a set of slave codes. And that is the first time you see whiteness as a race kind of introduced and codified into law. And it serves two purposes. Okay, so what, what it does, okay, so it serves, what those slave codes do is start to enshrine certain rights to people who are now understood as white people and to deny the most basic human rights or any recourse to any kind of justice under law to people who become known as, as, as black people. And um, there are very draconian punishments um, kind of to then be meted out to black people under these codes. And it's at this point that we start to see the association uh, with whiteness as, um, and people who come to, be see, come to be seen as white people, as you know, being kind of like inherently, having this, um, being the, the masters, the natural masters over the other, over the other race. And it serves two purposes. Um, these are, firstly, um, this is part of the process of the justification of slavery and the dehumanization of black people that is required to justify the slave trade, which is becoming increasingly important and is generating a lot of wealth and these colonial economies and ultimately uh, kind of the Western world economies are going to become more and more dependent on. So this idea of this kind of inherent superiority and inherent inferiority, inherent superiority for white people and inherent inferiority for black people is necessary to justify sl slavery, and this, these processes of dehumanization, but it also shuts down the possibility of those type of coalitions or moments of solidarity that you were seeing emerging between indentured European laborers and enslaved Africans who had uh, comparably kind of, who, who had kind of shared experiences and saw landowners and the elites as a, as a common enemy. And the second time, the, an, another key example of, um, of these slave codes and this mainstream introducing and ultimately mainstreaming of the idea of race that we still have today, we see in colonial Virginia not long after that. Again, it's slave codes that are introduced after an uprising between indentured English laborers and enslaved Africans who attack the English elite of the colony of Virginia. So that's our, our understandings of black and white that we have today emerge from that period specifically. Talking about that power imbalance that's seen as inherent, could you talk about 
white saviorism and how that relates to allyship? Yeah, absolutely. So um, allyship was something that I was always really reluctant to contribute to any discourse on, even though I was constantly, not constantly, but regularly being asked to. Uh, I actually opened the book with an incident where um, I was on stage doing like a really, really big event. And the conversation, I loved the conversation. We touched on everything from Afrofuturism to you know African philosophies, the relationship between trap music and the blues, lots of stuff around like cultural production and African studies and the type of stuff that I have kind of um, taught through teaching African studies, you know, for a really long time. And that the audience was mostly white, um, probably almost yeah, exclusively white because of the part of the world that I was in. And afterwards, somebody came up to me and they were like, you know, that was interesting, but their sense was it was a missed opportunity because they were like, could you not have talked about allyship? I was just like, for God's sake, like, no, I don't want to center. No, I want to talk mm -hmm. about the rich um, cultural world um, that, you know, has been created by uh, people, of, people of African descent and the diaspora and that has kind of informed um, modern popular culture. I don't want to, like, basically give you tips. I didn't say this to her, <laughs> thinking in my head. I was like, I don't want to give you tips on how to better recognize my humanity, you know? So mm -hmm. th th I was just kind of like, that's not, that's, not, that's not what I want to do. That's not what I want to talk about. Um, I don't want to center you. However, with everything that happened in 2020 and the murder of George Floyd, this conversation about allyship was, you know, becoming like front and center. It was really, really mm -hmm. high on the agenda. And it was at that point that I felt, no, I actually have some fundamental issues with how a lot of this is framed, I'm going to have to come out of my refusal to talk <laughs> about this topic and actually kind of make a, a contribution to this, to this conversation because there's a lot of dynamics in it that actually make me feel really uncomfortable and that I think are not bringing us to the place we claim we want to get to, but are, is actually reinforcing lots of the problems that we have. And mm -hmm. that's what this book is. Um, but yeah, so you know kind of the basic tenets of allyship, um, there's not necessarily like an official consensus, but there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of um, themes that you can identify, a lot of them proliferate on social media, that's a place where you'll find lots of them. Um, and one of the things that I always find quite worthy of note is this idea, do not ask to be taught or shown. Yes, yes. Do not ask to be taught or shown. Um, and I'm like, oh, that's quite interesting. Okay, so where are people supposed to get information mm -hmm. from? But do not ask to be taught or shown. Um, and then the other one, Google is your friend. So I'm like, okay, let me follow the advice. I'm somebody that is interested in this. I can't ask to be taught or shown. Yeah. Um, Google's my friend. Okay, let me Google it. So I Googled it. I Googled like allyship. And the stuff that came up was wild. Like I don't want people to take that as their kind of blueprint for how we create, um, wow, these lights are kind of intense. Yeah, they're great, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> like kind of like seeing shapes. I hope I'm not about to pass out. Um, maybe I'll have some water. That might be a good idea. A bit of rehydration rather than more coffee. Um, yes, so um, where was I? You were talking about, and it was something I found really interesting because you talk in the book about the difference between information and knowledge. Yes. And how that is something that we should consider of mm -hmm. not just kind of, you know, I pretty much just wrote down, is Google really my friend after <laughs> that bit? Right. And I think well, that's a fair point to make and about how when people engage in this discourse, often they'll be told, I'm not here to tell you, I'm not here to show you, you can do this yourself. Mm -hmm. Although that's kind of how I was with the woman who wanted me to talk about allyship at the talk. So like I get, like, <laughs> yeah. you know what, I get it, I get it. But at the same time, there has to be, um, if you're like an activist or an, there has, there has to be people, uh, reliable sources that you can go to. It can't just be Googling this stuff, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I Googled it. The stuff that came up, I, have, I, I quote some of it in the, in the book. 
I saw quite a few references to the ally and the victim. Yeah. And I was just like, oh God, no, the victim. Um, that is troubling to me. And that started to, the bit that I read, one of the parts of the excerpt that I read from the book, when you think about, um, when I drew that kind of parallel between anti-slavery abolitionists, yeah. you know, who were these charitable, Christ, often, not always, but mm -hmm. charitable Christian people who were, who often believed that, you know, black people were racial, they're racial inferiors, but they mm -hmm. just didn't think they should be enslaved as a result of it. Um, I could see resonances and I was just like, if you're kind of seeing all black people as like inherent victims, who are you, their savior? Mm -hmm. um, and then I was thinking about when I was growing up in Ireland and very much the um, attitude that existed to, there were very, very, very few black people in the country or any people of color, or any diversity in the country when, when I was born, um, when I was a child in the, in the 1980s. And the images of Africa that you did see were very much from the context of the, the missions, like mm -hmm. the Irish missionaries in Africa. There was always very much a sense of, um, again, African people as being people who are in need yes. of charity, help, and benevolent white people mm -hmm. who, you know, out of kindness and charity will help them. So I could see resonances to that. And I was like, this is not, this, 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 this is not the approach. So what I say in the book is allyship, um, it offers charity at the expense of solidarity. Yes. What I try to encourage is, in the book is a sense of understanding that the world is, sorry, like I don't want to be like full of doom and gloom, but like the world <laughs> is kind of fucked, you know? <laughs> um, and that is going, that affects us all, yeah. you know? So I try and draw the connections um, between racism, between environmental justice, mm -hmm. how the root of lots of different forms of oppression and exploitation find their origins in the same system mm -hmm. so that we can identify the fact that even if our struggles are presented to us in this atomized way as all being very separate to each other, mm -hmm. the reason that we're having that struggle often comes from the same source. If we can identify that, we can work together in ways that create coalitions, that create mass movements mm -hmm. that are so powerful that we can't be ignored, rather than seeing an intersectionality of, um, of issues yeah. rather than identities. Definitely. You know? So talking about the system that we're all under, I mean, probably a bit of a big question, but can equality ever exist outside of capitalism? I mean, I don't know how it can because yeah. capitalism is, um, capitalism requires in inequality and the exploitation of resources <laughs> yeah. to exist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even if you get your seat at the table under the current system, there's a lot of representational seat at the table politics in the current things that present themselves as anti-racist discourse currently. Um, even if you get your seat at the table or people that look like you get their seat at the table, the table is still built on the back of somebody else, of another group. Mm -hmm. um, if we are in a system that requires inequality and exploitation to function, how can we create equality with, within that? You know, We might make it okay for ourselves, but only at the expense of somebody else, only at the expense of the Earth's resources, you know? And this idea of like infinite growth as well, you know, that it's not, it's not sustainable quite clearly. Mm -hmm. And you talked in the book as well, when talking about the relationship between race and capitalism. Is intersectionality a good tool to understand the relationship between class and race? Um, I have a whole section on intersectionality, mm -hmm. on identity politics. Yes. And um, I kind of touch on intersectionality because I have something of a critique of identity yeah. politics as it currently um, manifests itself, mostly on online spaces. My critique comes from a very, very different place from the critique of identity politics that you get from racists or that you get often from people who are right wing, mm -hmm. you know? It, 
it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's very different to that. And I might read a little section on that to, to, make, it, mm -hmm. to make it clearer. Because um, that, bit, that bit's a little bit complex. In that bit of the book, I'm actually like taking theory from something I've been working on from ideas that I was introduced mm -hmm. to through my PhD yeah. that are actually like quite complex mm -hmm. that I'm trying to um, communicate like in a very accessible way. So while I do it in the book, to do it succinctly here might be like a yeah, little yeah. bit, um, might be a little bit of a challenge with the constraints of time. That big clock is great. I know, it's isn't fabulous. It? It's really like yeah. keeping me in check. Because I think you really do that <laughs> succinctly in the book and right before the section where you talk about intersectionality, um, which, like, right before it, you say, get your highlighters ready. <laughs> so you, you, you do it very succinctly. Um, and as well, if you could um, explain the concept of intersectionality before we discuss the critique, just in case anybody isn't. So I don't really have, I don't really have a critique of intersectionality in mm -hmm. the book. I just have a... I have a not, it's not, I don't even know if it's a critique of ident identity politics. It's just... Let me just read that bit. I think that would, be, that would just be easier. Where is that bit? Redistribute resources. Recognize this shit is killing you too. I think it's in there. So I'm just trying to work out how much to. Um, if I read like three pages, yeah. is that too much? Can you deal? Can you cope with that? <laughs> <laughs> Might be four. I'll read quickly. Okay. So this is in the section post activism. Okay, which is the okay. So recognize this shit is killing you too is one of the chapters, and then that's followed by post activism. So ten years ago, probably even five, my response to racism conformed far more to a speaking truth to power framework. Like many concepts that become overused to the point of cliche. There was truth and necessity in the framing of truth to power. At that stage, there were far, still far fewer potential rewards for speaking out in contrast, in contrast to the celebrification of activism that has emerged over the last few years and has been turbocharged by the events of 2020. Until then, there was then, and still is now, a huge deficit in knowledge about the consequences of colonialism or an understanding of the ways in which the imperial conquest redesigned the world according to its logic. And I don't just mean the literal carving up of the world and the dispossession of people from their land or the murderous appropriation of territory by people who came from Europe and what would become their white descendants. And creating a new world order that continues to benefit white people in terms of offering a materially better life on violently stolen land from the United States to Canada, Australia, and South Africa. It's not just the kidnapping of and centuries of enforced labor for millions of people of African descent, and it's not just the creation of boundaries throughout the continent or the invention of nation states, not only in Africa, but across the world. Even the nation, nation state itself is a product of what we call white supremacy, imperialism, and capitalism. The old role of colonial settlers as a, de means of dis, as a means of disseminating economic compulsions has been taken over by local national states, which act as transmission belts for capitalist imperatives and enforce the laws of the market. So it is all of that. But I am talking about the colonizing of truth, the redesigning of the fabric of reality. I'm talking about the imposition of a way of classifying, measuring, and quantifying the world, including everything from time to temperature to distance to weight. All of these things became, became calculated and bounded by frameworks that were not only European, but often peculiarly English ways of understanding reality. And today's activism responds to the world on those terms. Not all of it, but most of it, and certainly the mainstream stuff. So today's activism responds to the world on these terms. Operating on terrain already mapped out by white supremacy, Eurocentric logic, and colonialism. This would be less worrying if it was clearly identified, 
it would not pose so grave a danger if there was an awareness that the terms of engagement operate within a framework that we need to dissolve. However, that acknowledgement appears to be entirely absent, and we congratulate ourselves on speaking truth to power, often depressingly via what we now call platform capitalism, so social media. We must understand the limitations of identity as a political force. Stemming from the political movements of the 1960s and 1970s, what later came to be understood as identity politics, identity politics reflected a particular approach to organizing, not to mention subjectivity, that was a necessary response to the forms of oppression that continued to be experienced by minoritized people. The phrase identity politics was coined in the 1970s by the Combahee River Collective, a group of expansively radical women who were black, lesbian, feminist socialists. It was their disillusionment with the liberation movements of the 1960s and 70s, as well as the experience on the periphery of the white male left that led to the need to develop a politics that was anti-racist, unlike those of white women, and that was anti-sexist, unlike those of black and white men. That's a quote of theirs from their mission statement. Um, nonetheless, the fact that identity was being mobilized by socialists, as these women were, oriented them towards collectivist objectives, and they were vocal about the fact that they were doing political work within their own group and in coalition with other progressive organizations and movements. In contrast, today's online identity politics, expressed through the neoliberal platform capitalism of social media, appears more concerned with protecting only the interests of those within the boundaries of a heavily policed in-group, and more often than not concerned with individual successes and the establishment and protection of lucrative personal brands. Yet even beyond the obvious limitations of the current hyper-capitalist hell version of identity politics sketched here, the far more ethical form practiced by earlier activists still relied on coordinates mapped out by the codes of white supremacy. While it was a radical and necessary step at the time, which achieved the impressive task of creating awareness of the realities of people whose experiences had been historically disregarded, identity politics requires a self-reflexive understanding of its own limitations and in fact, the collective, who coined the phrase, stated their commitment to a continual examination of their politics as they develop through criticism and self-criticism as an essential aspect of their practice. So there was, they, they weren't like weaponizing their identities, they were being constantly self-reflexive and self-critical. But ultimately, rigid identities need to dissolve in order to avoid becoming immobilized in the death grip of their creator, white supremacy, interlocked in an infinite standoff of oppositional exchange, a struggle that can never end. I'm almost finished. Today, identity has become a way to manage difference that colludes with dominant forms of liberal multiculturalism. Dif this, is, this is a quote from um, uh, uh, an American, um, a uh, feminist scholar. Difference, pr uh, called uh, P Puar is her surname, P-U-A-R. Um, difference produce, hang on, I think that's who the quote is from. I don't have it written in here. I just have the little um, footnote. Um, difference now proceeds, sorry, difference produces new subjects of in in inquiry and then infinitely multiplies exclusion in order to promote inclusion. Difference now precedes and defines identity. It relies on the subject X, and you can insert race, gender, sexuality, class, or disability. Um, and that's the, the, the subject formation. This atomizes the limitless variety of subjectivity into lists of knowable categories that reduce in order to acknowledge flattening the complexity of being into neatly bounded classifications that produce a subject who is defined by their difference, who can then be governed and appealed to accordingly, not to mention targeted for advertising. That's probably the most theoretical the book gets, so I hope that was, I hope that was clear. Um, and it might be a bit hard to digest, I, I apologize. <laughs> if you read it yourself, you'll get it. Um, in the book you talk about um, abandoning guilt 
And there, there's a quote in the book that talks of the hand wringing of guilt versus the hand holding of solidarity. And when we're talking about these structures, I think guilt can often feel like part of the conversation. So why, why should guilt be abandoned? So I feel we get like, the conversation gets paralyzed. Again, I'm often talking about the, this book was in many ways a response to the dynamics and the type of anti-racist narrative I was seeing playing out online. Mm -hmm. Jesus. And um, I hate blue balls like so much. <laughs> gone, <laughs> be gone. Um, that I was seeing playing out online. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what, what we often see is things not progressing beyond this, um, people kind of being paralyzed, yeah, by guilt. And there being these exchanges that are kind of about interpersonal guilt and recrimination. Mm -hmm. And they often kind of prevent further, we get kind of like paralyzed mm -hmm. there. So um, I think that guilt is, um, to quote Audrey Lord, who's one of the founding members of the Combahee River Collective, who I was just talking about, the group who coined the phrase identity politics. Um, I draw on Lord's work quite a lot in the work and in the book. Um, she talks about guilt being an incomplete form of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Guilt might, um, or creating incomplete forms, like she says that guilt might spur you to further action. Mm -hmm. And in that, in, in that case, it can be productive. But if you're just mired in the, in the guilt, mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's, not, um, it's not generative. And when I look at the forms of, when I look at examples of allyship that feel like they are motivated from a place of the actor trying to assuage their sense of guilt yeah. or try and get rid of their sense of guilt, that's a very, very different motivation um, then, and a very, a different action will be taken. There is a different imperative there when the action is being inspired by somebody who is kind of committed to solidarity and coalition. So I think actions that are taken as a result of trying to make yourself feel less guilty, mm -hmm. um, there's a very different motivation. And so there will be, there'll be different actions. And I often see, and also just the, the, the hand wringing and the kind of, again, it can be, quite self-indulgent. It can be about making yourself feel better. Mm -hmm. And then also there are forces, especially as all of this stuff plays out online, that, um, that kind of will encourage those guilty feelings and people mm -hmm. feel like they're doing something progressive by, it, by I guess, being mired like in that mm -hmm. guilt. And it really is something that, one of the things I say in the book is, um, like there's not really, there's no need to, nobody is responsible for what their ancestors did, you know? Um, you're responsible, people are responsible for what they do. So you're responsible for what you do. You're responsible for the choices that, that you make, but you can't be responsible for um, what, for something we've inherited, you know, um, kind of from centuries before we were born. So there's really no need to feel guilty and to use guilt as an excuse not to do anything, you know? I think in the book, you, you make this such a clear case of us all being in this together. And um, there's a chapter that comes from a quote that is, is it Fred Moten, recognize that this shit is killing you too. Mm -hmm. and, and how we all need to come together. And I think you expand on this sort of global sense of us all being a, in it together when you talk about the environment and you pose the idea that maybe it's plants who are our, our allies. Oh my God, I'm so glad you um, brought that up. That's probably like one of my favorite lines in the I book. And I don't it. think I anyone else has excellent. mentioned it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, could you talk a bit about the environment and, and, and the role it could play going forward? Or, and also actually, I'm aware of time and we will go to questions, but I really wanted to ask you about parallel institutions as well and, and sort of all these other areas that we can be thinking about. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'll start, I'll start with the plants. Um, <laughs> so so um, one of the questions I pose in the book is, like, who were we before race was invented? 
Like who were all of the various groups that now constitute white people? Who were they before they were white people? I come from Ireland, so a lot of the um, uh, generalized uh, statements or the generalized things that were being said about white people, I was like, that doesn't really apply necessarily in the same way. I don't know, that doesn't apply exactly the same way in the Irish context as it does in England, mm -hmm. as it does in the United States. Like, we need more specificity. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions I pose is like, who were you before you were white? Like, who, who were white people before they were racialized in that way? And I talk about how um, the, the types of logic and the type of systems that created race and the historical period that created race is also um, where we begin, we start to see the beginnings of the disconnect, of our disconnect from the, from the natural world. Yes. And the intellectual traditions um, and the ideas that we've inherited from, from, from the, some of the ideas that we've inherited you know, from the Enlightenment, um, which l create this binary way, or Descartes and this binary way of thinking that lends itself so well to the world being divided between black and white, um, and you know, culture versus nature, and man versus mm -hmm. nature. Um, this disconnect from the natural world and for the human, for man, for the human to see themselves as separate to and superior to the natural world rather than completely entangled with it and a part of it um, is something that, you know, we need to reorient our, our, our thinking. You know, we wouldn't have the same relationship with the environment if we saw ourselves as this integral part of it rather as, than this dominant, you know, force that can just exploit it. And um, I came across a concept actually from, from Scottish Gaelic, um, and I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> I don't know, maybe if somebody here can. Um, but do, do, do cause? Do cause? It's in the book. Um, <laughs> I actually, it's like D-U-T, I'll come back to that because I don't want to waste too much time. But anyway, what the concept is, is looking at the entanglement between ma human, human, humans, the land, and the non-human. I mean, that's language kind of from, from today, but essentially conceptually, that's what this concept is. I think due course is looking at it is looking at we have it in Irish as well but in Irish the more modern meaning of it is is your heritage or the land that you come from but the description I saw of it in kind of Scots Gaelic was um was actually more explicitly the interconnectivity of the human the non-human and the land mm -hmm. and I think it's those kind of relationships that we need to be um you know, focusing on. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole kind of, you know, psychedelic renaissance. And I talk a little bit about um, kind of uh, psilocybin and, 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 and mushrooms. And the idea, I reject the idea of white allyship, but I propose instead that perhaps it's plants that are our allies. And perhaps reconsidering our relationship with plant technology, with like plant knowledge, um, would help us understand differently approach our relationship to the to the environment. Amazing. So um, no one ever asked me about that bit. So obviously, <laughs> I loved when Terence McKenna came up. So I studied um, religious studies and I had a pal who was obsessed with Terence McKenna. Um, never accepted a cup of tea they brewed me, but was like pretty pretty chuffed to see that. So we've got time for questions from the audience. If anybody would like to ask, please don't be shy. I also have questions from online, so if you're watching at home, you can pop your questions in the chat. There's one down the front. Hello. Sorry. Hi, Emma. Hi, Emma. <laughs> Great to see you in the flesh. <laughs> um, so my question was about allyship. And in the book, you say, you know, you frame it really well. I had never actually read it like that before. Thanks. And you said that it inadvertently, you know, reinforces what it claims to want to overcome. And I'm just wondering if allyship is part of a journey that we have to go through, like to come to the realization that it's harmful. 
you know, do you have to go through it in order to realize that it's bad? Or can you just go from being anti-racist, uneducated, to just being, you know, where we should be? Yeah, cool. Kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Should I, should I, should, are we going to go one by one, or are we taking a group of questions? We'll do or? one by one. Okay, cool. I prefer that. I feel le less overwhelmed. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. I don't think we really have time to be like, oh, we're just trying stuff out. Let, oh, that doesn't work. Let's, uh, I think we actually have to be more committed to being strategic and, um, and, 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 and really doing things differently, you know, with a, with a, with a sense of urgency. Um, I, I honestly think the way a lot of allyship, in terms of anti-racist and specifically white, white allyship, um, is framed is the wrong framing and is just leading us down the garden path. I don't think we need to go down that direction to realize it's the wrong direction. But also, also I do want to say that I'm not telling anyone to, what to do. Um, what I don't like about a lot of the mainstream anti-racist stuff is it's rather than kind of, or just online discourse, rather than more generally, rather than, you know, helping people learn how to think in the way that like kind of other forms of, well, in the way that knowledge does rather than just information consumption, rather than kind of uh, helping people, uh, yeah, kind of learn how to think. It tells you what to think. It's like super didactic. I'm really not telling anybody they must do this. This is a list of things um, that they have to do or they're voted off the island or like they're canceled or whatever. You know, that's, that's not it. I'm just um, offering like another, another perspective and another pr proposal. Yeah, you're welcome. Then we've got a question from online. So Kate, um, who has prefaced this, um, stating that this question is from a white middle class woman. Thanks for your great book. Absolutely agree on talking slash po on, on talking slash posting without acting in coalition to change structural racism. Do you agree white people need to do some work about being conscious of patterns of interpersonal microaggressions as well as the history to be able to work together in coalition with people? Yeah, like like. One of the things I have in the book that is less like conceptual and is just like more, you know, kind of straightforward and is more kind of, um, I guess, some of the ideas that um, you'll see in more kind of mainstream anti-racism is pull people up on racism. I intentionally don't say call, call people out on racism because there are certain um, phrases, you know, I talk a little bit about cliches in the book. There are certain phrases that me, just even as a writer, I'm like, I can't bring myself to use these terms because yeah. they're ones that people are just now kind of almost repeating by, by rote. Mm -hmm. But I do talk about, um, you know, experiences that I would have had growing up where there were kind of racist jokes were mm -hmm. pretty common. I would be the only black person present. Um, and if I kind of challenged it, it'd be like, oh, you know, it's just, it's only a bit of crack. Like, it's just a, it's yeah. just a joke, like kind of chip on your shoulder, all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So I do kind of touch on stuff like that, but I think that kind of stuff around micro, and yeah, and I think that you need to be aware of those tendencies. Certainly when I was a teenager, I found a child and a teenager, I found that type of thing, um, you know, like very, very, very troubling and exhausting. Mm -hmm. um, not that I don't find it now, it just doesn't happen yeah. as frequently, you know. Um, but I think that kind of stuff around microaggressions is far better attended to in the, in the more mainstream conversation. So while I touch on it and I highlight its importance, mm -hmm. I want to cover some of the stuff that just gets disregarded yeah. and ignored that I think is also really key. And I think like when you were talking about um, sort of like online phrases, you've got like check your privilege and, and things like that. And I wanted to ask you, so I associate these phrases specifically with Twitter. Do you think that these conversations would be different, say, if we would have, well, were we having them on MySpace? Would it have been different on different um, social media platforms? Yeah, I think different. Jesus, MySpace. Um, <laughs> I was going to bring up Bebo, but then I was like, maybe that's, uh, oh, I don't know if that was just me. And MySpace was like very music related yeah. and kind of apolitical. And you talk about music as well in the book. So I wonder like, oh, yeah, would yeah, it I be do. people sharing specific songs or, I mean, <laughs> using coding, having some backgrounds? <laughs> um, yeah, I think d different platforms, you know, have like different, in different interfaces. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I think, you know, like particularly on Twitter, there's a real content that like, you know, is highly emotive and sensationalist mm -hmm. and like generates like outrage performs really well mm -hmm. so there's there's actually like a um there's an incentive yeah. to err towards that kind of material rather than a uh, stuff that's maybe like just a little bit more complex or considered mm -hmm. uh less incendiary incendiary um the, 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 those 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 phrases i just think you know like i think initially again Initially, they they would have had utility, mm -hmm. but I just think they've been commodif commodified. They've also just been abused. They've been kind of rendered. I, I don't know how helpful they are in 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 this moment. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Have we got more questions from the audience? We've got one in the second row there, and then after that, we've got one in the third row. I wondered if you could say a bit more about hope. I was struck recently in reading something that Paul Gilroy wrote, describing himself as a cosmic pessimist. So I wondered if you could talk a bit more about where you source your sense of hope from. Thank you. Um, I love that question. So he was saying he was a cosmic pe pe pessimist. So I, I'm not, I'm not for, yeah, I'm, I, I wanna know more about the, the, <laughs> the context of that and what constitutes a cosmic pessimist. I'm intrigued. Um, my sense of hope. Where, so, are you, are, you, did, are you asking, do I have a sense of hope? Or are you identifying that I have one and asking me to expand <laughs> more on it? Sometimes it's obvious somebody with a sense of hope. Sorry, I couldn't hear. My sense of, of you is somebody who, who is writing from a position of hope, of hopefulness. But I wonder, in relation to perhaps the world is fucked, we're all fucked. <laughs> Recognise the shit that we're all in. Yeah, yeah. Where do you source your sense of hopefulness from? Thank you. So I didn't actually know if the world is, is I feel like now it's just, I've become too, uh, I've, I've sworn too much. I've used up my, um, I've used up <laughs> the amount of times I can curse. So the world is at, I think the world will probably be the world actually will probably be grand, like maybe mm -hmm. art, the world will probably still be here and we just might not be, <laughs> you know? Um, I honestly don't know. I feel like it's something, it's something that's just like an integral, like an integral part of me. Um, I feel really joyful um, at, when I look at what humans, can produce when I look at like, you know, mm -hmm. cultural production from, I talk quite a bit about music in the book, like music and, and literature actually just completely like, oh, if I like it, obviously. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, just completely kind of overawe me, the, 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 the world, um, the natural world, but also what people have, what people have created, like looking out the window in our, in the green room mm, and it's beautiful. looking out over <laughs> Edinburgh, um, is just like, you know, it's just completely awe inspiring. Mm -hmm. Like there's so much, there's so much beauty in the world and there's so much joy and, and, and life in the world. That, that's just a constant source of inspiration mm -hmm. from me. I think I'm like a slightly like hysterical person. Not, <laughs> not, hysterical is not the right yeah. word. Let me not say that. Like a slightly kind of, I don't know, I can be I kind of... You imbue like a sort of hope because it's, it's like a no BS book. Like it doesn't, it doesn't waste time. And I think it gets to this point of this idea of, of unity and that we are all in this together. So actually we have more people on our side if we can understand the frameworks that you mm -hmm. lay out. I think you give tools, using the tools that you put in the book presents me with an idea of a future that I want. And that's where I get such a strong sense of hope. I mean, like sack capitalism, chuck it in the bin. And I think that you draw more lines you, you draw more of us together than you pull, and you pull a system apart, but you're not pulling people apart. And that's where I get such a big sense of hope um, from reading this book. I bloody loved it. Like, see, saying <laughs> getting galvanized, I was like ready to kick down a door and go and just make loads of pals as well. Um, so we've got um, another question in the audience there. So much. Thank you so much, Emma, for coming up. Um, I've got quite a big question. For oh, me. gosh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> the question is this. In the dismantling of capitalism, how important is it to hold 
that serve a variety of alternate visions? Or is it more important to focus on the process and leave that open and think about the kinds of alternative realities that will develop out of the process? Sorry, would you mind repeating the question? Yeah, absolutely. So my question is, when we're thinking about dismantling capitalism, mm -hmm. is it important to have an alternative vision of what that could be, or a variety, let's say, maybe even drawing on, let's say, black anarchism, or looking at pre-colonial participatory democracies in West Africa and that kind of thing? Ooh. Or is it important to focus, like Fred Motum would say, the focus on the process of dismantling capitalism, and then those realities would then naturally evolve from the process? Yeah, what a fantastic question. question. Thank you. And such great references as well. Like, this is what gives me joy. Um, and the black radical tradition, which I, which I draw on quite a lot in the book. The black radical tradition is, like, to me, so much more expansive and exciting than kind of mainstream um, anti-racist discourse. Um, so, yeah, Fred Moden talks about the fact that um, we, we, we can't even imagine, like, what it is that um, we will want because what we want will be different after we've, you know, kind of after the break, after, after the change. So I don't know. I think it's good to have um, visions in, in, in mind as maybe inspiration, but not being wedded to necessarily, to a fixed sense of, but we must make it look like this. We must achieve this specifically. It can be used maybe like as, as a vision, you know, but we should also bear in mind that we can't even imagine what it is that uh, from, from this perspective, from this position, we, don't, we perhaps don't even know what we want. So a combination of the two. That's all we've got time for today. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Um, I hope you've had a lovely afternoon. Um, and I would ask if you could join me again in um, giving Emma a round of applause. Thank you.